very good morning to every one of you who is joining us today as we commemorate the Global Day of Access to Safe and Legal Abortion within the country, which is scheduled to take place tomorrow. This live dialogue is supposed to discuss an issue which is highly contentious and an issue which has brought a lot of controversy and put a lot of people on the fence. Some are on this side of the fence, others are on the other side of the fence, others are seated on the fence. Today we come to dispel some myths we come to give information and we come to discuss what way forward we have to have when it comes to access to safe and legal abortion within the country. Uh, we are proud to say that this particular campaign, which is the Safe and Legal Care campaign, is being uh, hosted by the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, which is SEHAD, but is being funded by several partners, including SAF, Amplified Change, uh, the Jazz Program, but ultimately it is being brought together by the coalition to stop maternal mortality due to unsafe abortion in the country. So without further ado, we have a very long agenda ahead of us. We have a keynote speech from the president of the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is AUGU. We have a long panel of experts who are going to tell us a few things here and there about abortion in the country. And finally, we shall have some closing remarks from a very special guest who I shall announce later. So without much ado, I would like to invite Dr. Othnail Musana to come forward and deliver his keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Othiniel Musana. I will remove my mask. I'm vaccinated. And I hope most of you are distanced as we have seen. I support government programs to roll out the COVID vaccine. And I know that uh, COVID has caused problems for the last one, two years. And I pray we go through this pandemic in the best way possible. Honorable members of parliament here, the commissioners from the Ministry of Health, the legal fraternity that is available here, viewers at home, I would like to th thank you for honoring me to give this keynote address. I am Othiniel Musana, an obstetrician gynecologist by training. I am also a sub-specialist in treating women cancers, that is cervix and the ovary and the uterus. Most of my work is managing complications that come from other gynecologists and other doctors, and a good chunk of it is managing complications to do with unsafe abortion. So as an individual, I think I am able to speak well on this topic because we manage the women who come in with complications. As you're told, I'm the president-elect for the AOGU, which is the body that unites all OBS and GAIN people, practice professionals in Uganda. Currently, I'm employed at North Park Rest Hospital, where I'm the chief of obstetrics, and I'm a gyne oncologist. I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, a father of two daughters, and this is touching to me as a person. I have no financial conflict to declare, sorry. And this is mainly based on my experience, but also what I have learned over the months in advocating to end mortality because of unsafe abortion. Awogu is a health professional association which was founded in 1989, and its vision is to be leaders in reproductive health in the region, and this we do through excellence in practice, education, research, collaborations, and of late now we are focusing on advocacy. We are leaving the hospitals and the clinics to come and advocate for our clients, wherever they are. We have a program dealing with advocacy, which is called the Advocacy for the Prevention of Mother Maternal Midday Mortality, a PPM project, and that is how we come to link with SESIMUA, because they have similar goals, and they have a similar, so we are aligned to their vision as well, which is making sure no woman dies from an unsafe abortion. So Awogo is a member of Sesemoa as well. Our project is mainly dealing with advocacy to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity from unsafe abortion. We don't normally advocate for the change in the law, but we know that the legal framework in the country is among the contributing factors towards unsafe abortion. And we hope that uh, by the end of this presentation, 
members will have understood why sometimes we need to clarify the legal framework, but also the medical framework that we have in this country. So in 2013, a big article came out in the vision that 1,500 women die a year from unsafe abortion. After about a month, another one came out in the monitor that 800 abortions are procured daily. 800 abortions are procured daily. Now, interesting in the media is the word procure. Procure seems to have something linked with the, the law. In medicine, we don't procure. We offer services. But these were procured daily. And in this case, they were focusing mainly on, I think, the, what they used to term those days as illegal. We used to call them illegal and criminal. So we'd criminalize the women who come to hospital for such services. Of late, given the COVID pandemic, there's been a spike in unplanned pregnancies. And of course, with the spike in unplanned pregnancies, comes a spike in abortions. Comes a spike in abortions. The word abortion always elicits negative emotion. Always elicits negative emotion. So when I'm saying abortion, abortion is a medical term, but it has been vulgarized in other arenas to mean something negative. So in September, in May this year, Guru reported 4,000 abortion cases in 15 months. It means they have really seen a spike of abortions just within Guru itself. But also, lately, articles are saying that there's an abortion, the rise in abortion cases among adolescents they haven't been in school for the last two years. So there is a problem happening. There is another pandemic we are sitting on and it's killing our daughters and our children. If you look at the annual health sector report for 2019-2020, this is the ministry's document that tells us the causes of death or how the sector performed in the previous year. Abortions and their complications accounted for 10%. So one in 10 of the women who came, who died because of pregnancy was an abortion. Now this is an increase, a doubling actually, from the previous year 2018-2019. So the previous year was 5%, suddenly there is a spike to 10%. Current information actually says abortions account for about 8%. The ministry has a very good framework for monitoring these deaths on a weekly basis. Now, the deaths they are monitoring are the ones which happen in health facilities and the ones they're actually reporting back to the ministries. Some are never reported. So abortions account for about 8%. If you look at the women who are dying because any cause of death from pregnancy, really, those between 10 and 19 years from that report, we're accounting for 10%. So out of every 100 deaths, there are 10 women who die between the age of 10 years and 19 from pregnancy. Now, this is 10 to 19, not 15 to 19, 10 years. So it means some pregnancies occur even at 10 years. If you add on the others between 20 and 24, I'm trying to stick on this issue because these are the age groups which are supposed to be in school. So 20 and 24, 26%. So if you add these two age groups below 24 years, about 36% of the women who are dying from pregnancy and these complications are less than 24 years. So basically four in 10 are less than 24 years. This causes us to think about how we deal with the, these things. Now, let us think about the UDHS information that was offered in 2016, demographic health survey. 25% or one in four of our adolescents, 15 to 19, has begun childbearing. And the older the girl grows as an adolescent, the higher the chances of having begun childbearing. So people who are about 15 years, only 3% have begun childbearing. When they jump to 17 years, two years later, about 22% have begun childbearing. And by the time they reach 19, more than half of them, 54%, have actually begun childbearing. So it means between 15 and 20 and 19, there must be a package of interventions to stop childbearing. But also what's interesting in this report is that most of the girls who became pregnant are out of school. So if you compare those out of school compared to those in school, there is a big difference. So 35% of those who had begun childbearing 
we are not in school. Compared to 11% of those who had begun childbearing, we are in school. So almost three times. So it means education and staying in school may be protective to these young women and the children. I still call them children sometimes. How big is the problem of abortion? We actually don't know. Because the way we collect the information on abortion is not very standard throughout the country. But with the new ministry program, I hope that this can improve. The last estimates we had for abortion was in 2013, where they did an estimate, and this was published information. And uh, at that time in 2013, there were about 8 million women, based on UDHS data. And the live births that year were 1.64 million live births. So the number of births was 1.64. The total number of women treated for abortions in health facilities, not those ones we don't count, the ones we count, was 128,000. 128,600 women treated for abortions. Now, when we say abortions, it is both those happening naturally and those which are being terminated for either medical or non-medical reasons. Now, of those 128,000, 93,000 were actually terminated for non-medical reasons. Out of 128,000, 93,000 for non-medical reasons. If you look and see each region as they broke it down, places like Kampala have about 21,000 abortions. The ones we can actually see in the health facilities, not the ones which don't come. But basically every region most of the abortions happening were the ones that were being induced for non-medical reasons. And these were women aged 15 to 49 who were in the reproductive age group. When we came to induced abortions, remember these are estimates. Now we're talking now more estimates. The low estimate for the country is about 200,000 abortions every year. But well, that is based on health facilities those are induced, not the other type which is happening naturally, induced. These are normally for non-medical reasons, rape, legal, whatever reasons. Uh, and the high estimate is almost half a million. So anywhere between 200,000 to half a million people are actually having an abortion within the country. So, and no region in the country is spared. So every region in the country has a problem about the burden of abortion. Now, as health workers, this is from experience. Women come to us every day. I'm a gynecologist. I have gynecologists in this room and many others, nurses, midwives, who are serving the population, really. When these women come to us when they are pregnant, there are some who come to you and they, are, they have a planned pregnancy, they planned it, and they want to keep it. So those ones will go through antenatal, and we manage them as, as that. There are some who come when they planned their pregnancy, it was a planned pregnancy. But along the way, for some reason, that pregnancy becomes unwanted. And they may come to you seeking to terminate it. But sometimes they are undecided. So it is planned, but later, for some reason, it becomes unwanted. Then we have the women who have unplanned pregnancies, unplanned. But they say, for, I'll keep it for some reason. It was not planned, but I'll keep it either for social or religious reasons, they will keep the pregnancy. But there's a category of women where it was not planned and it is definitely unwanted. And this category of women, from my experience, whatever you do, whether you cancel what, they will seek to terminate that pregnancy. So all these categories of, preg of pregnancies can have an abortion. But the ones who choose to terminate, or the ones where we choose as med medics to terminate the pregnancies, also fall in these categories. So you may have a planned pregnancy and we terminate data for some reason, maybe medical. So women who particularly come seeking for abortion services, over time you learn to speak to the women and listen, 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 and understand where they are coming from. Some women come and tell you directly, doctor, I want to terminate this pregnancy. Are you giving it to me or not? If you don't, let me look for somewhere else. Okay? The others who come planning to terminate the pregnancy, but they need medical advice on how it is to be done, 
and where to do it from safely. I'm marking my words carefully. They come, doctor, I want to avoid, I want to remove, terminate this pregnancy. I won't use the word abortion because it will make people feel, you know, I want to terminate this pregnancy, but can you tell me the safest method and where I can get it from? Do you know a colleague? Do you know a hospital? Do you know that group is there? They want information. There is a group who is not yet decided, should I terminate the pregnancy or should I not? And they also come and seek for advice in the hospitals. Then there are those where we normally treat in hospitals who come with complications. They've had an abortion, which may be from natural causes or induced abortion, and they're coming for treatment. We now have to save a life. We have to save a life, and these ones come normally bleeding. Some bleed to death, which kills them. Some come with severe infection. Some come because of the induced abortions. They may come with organ damage. Intestines are torn, uterus is torn, and things like that. So those categories of women approach us daily. And I'm sure my colleagues out there and the practitioners will understand this. So because of also, we come from the same community as the women come from. So when these women come to us, of course we're also human beings. We're also, we're also brought up as Christians, Muslims, Basoga, Baganda. We have our own beliefs as health workers. And we also judge them sometimes. First of all, in Uganda, we, all we've had is abortion is illegal. So we normally call them, this is illegal and it is criminal. Even some who can report may sometimes report. Hmm? How dare she abort? She's a prostitute, she's unfaithful, she's an adulterer, she's all sorts of things we call them. We stigmatize them even before. Hmm? She's a murderer, why is she killing an innocent baby? But if they also aborted you, so normally the things we hear in the health sector, as we manage these women who have come to seek abortion services. Now, as I told you in the beginning that abortion is a medical term. It is not a social term. And medical terms, an abortion means a termination of a pregnancy. Terminating a pregnancy, irrespective of the reason. It may happen naturally, and people normally call those miscarriages. When a woman says, people tend to draw sympathy for her. But if she says, then stones will rain. Or people will tend to attack that woman. So, an abortion in medical terms simply means terminating a pregnancy irrespective of the cause or the reasons. Now we have spontaneous abortions. Spontaneous means they happen by themselves. And the cause is normally either an infection, an abnormality with the baby, and it just happens. But also we have what we call induced abortions. Induced, induced means that you purposefully terminating the pregnancy using artificial means either for medical reasons, um, catch my words, either for medical reasons, which you normally want to hide and say therapeutic abortion, hmm, or for non-medical reasons. Normally I prefer to call them social reasons. I don't want any more children, I don't want. But also there's a new category showing up these days, which is the legal, hmm, because of GBV and other things. There are many women coming to the hospitals for reasons that are based on that. So GBB, rape, incest. So induced abortions are not only, in my opinion, as a practitioner, the other ones for social reasons. Because even us as practitioners, we induce abortions for medical reasons. And the methods we use are the same for medical reasons and are the same for the non-medical reasons. So it means a pra somebody like me who practices should be taught the right to think. Because when I go to hospital, I must treat the woman with the best method. Those who are doing it outside the non-medical medical reasons also have to do it the right way to save the women's lives. Now, a lot of talk has been spoken about safe abortion, safe abortion, safe abortion. And people tend to think when you say safe abortion, it means your pro-choice, that uh, you encourage women to go and abort or to terminate pregnancy. That is not true. WHO defines unsafe. Let me start from the unsafe one. Unsafe abortion. The unsafe can happen in the health facilities with trained people like me and anywhere else. Unsafe abortion will occur when a pregnancy is terminated, one, by person, persons lacking the necessary skills. So you go to the woman next door, she does something, you abort. 
necessary skills. Necessary skills here are the necessary medical skills. In an environment that does not conform to minimum medical standards. So you may find hospitals, health centers, clinics don't actually conform to minimum medical standards. So they also offer unsafe. But they may be trained. So it's either one of those two or both of them. Lack of skills, no minimum standards. So it is from that definition that we then derive what we call safe abortion. So for you to offer a safe abortion, you must use a method recommended internationally, and normally we use WHO standards. Because these are based on scientific evidence and the most recent evidence, because evidence keeps shifting as more research is done. The method used to perform the abortion must be appropriate for the age of the pregnancy and the person who is performing it must be up to date in knowledge and skill. Normally, I like to add to my students, within the legal and literary framework of Uganda, huh? because the, we don't about in a virtual. Then we have what we call the less safe. So there is the unsafe, there is the safe, then the less safe. Now, the less safe is what tends to normally occur in most of our facilities, where the health worker is using outdated methods. They're using, they're using something of 2013 and 2020 with the new methods. They're using an outdated method to perform the procedure, or the woman herself is using medication, but not in the recommended doses, because we keep shifting the doses eh, with time based on the evidence. Because she either lacks access to a trained person or the best information available for her. So there is unsafe, safe, and then there's less safe. So what are the methods we use for terminating pregnancies? This is, and it should be public information, so as a health fraternity, we have two methods. One is where we use surgery, and normally these ones uh, help us remove the uterine contents, and one of them is the popular MVA, and the other one is the DNC, lesion and curettage. But we also have non-surgical methods of terminating pregnancies in the health sector, and here we're using drugs majorly to, cause in con to, to induce contractions, and then expel the pregnancy for whatever reason. Now, both methods, both methods again, they used to terminate the pregnancy, but at the same time, both methods are also used to treat the complications of abortion. And this way, uh, is an area we normally find with law enforcement in harassing health workers. So we use them to terminate the pregnancy medically, but at the same time, we also use them to, to treat the complications of the abortion, what we call post-abortion care. So what is this so-called post-abortion care? Post-abortion care happens after the abortion has begun, after the miscarriage has begun, whichever you want to call it. And normally it includes a community and service provider partnerships. We want to prevent unwanted abortions, sorry, pregnancies and unsafe abortions. For those in the ministry who mobilize resources and other things, they also have their role to play. But also we want to ensure that the health sector is reflective of the community needs and expectations. We counsel the women. Counseling is very important, including those who are seeking to know the best method. Because if you tell her that this may kill you, she may, she may change her mind. But if you don't tell her, she will go and get killed somewhere. So we want to identify the woman's emotional and physical needs and other concerns. Then we also treat, treatment where we have incomplete abortions or unsafe abortions or other life-threatening complications. As part of post-abortion care, one of, the things, one of the goals is to prevent another pregnancy. So we offer family planning services to these women to allow them space their births or prevent another pregnancy. Then we have other reproductive health services, which include referrals. So as health workers, I think we need to have networks to know where services are offered safely. If you can't cancel, you've somebody who can cancel. If you can't do this, but of course, as we do our work as health workers, me personally, I think I've, I've had, I think, maybe several cases, really. We have challenges that we, have, that we face in providing safe abortion and post-abortion care. I have defined safe abortion. So I hope no one, no one will ask me choice and word, no. I have defined safe abortion medically and post-abortion care. We have service delivery challenges, 
and this is not only in the public sector, but even in the private sector. Irregular procurement, drug stockouts, sets, MBs are not being around, contraceptive stockouts, things, drugs which we use for abortion, like misoprostol, are being are sometimes not in stock in many of the facilities, both private and, and public. We also have poorly trained health workers that, that, may, that may limit the delivery of quality services for abortion. And uh, recently we did a review of curricula for health workers, pre-service, before they go into service, nursing, medical school, doctors, even specialist training, and we found that their curricula is deficient. Most of them, I think for whatever reason, don't mention abortion care as something important. But we are doing it every day. So many of them are coming out without the skills to manage abortion complications, or to even cancel these women when they do come to us. So those are the service delivery challenges. One of the other bigger challenges that we have found, and I think this is universal to most of us, is we have social, religious, pol policy, but also legal restrictions on abortions. Society will restrict what they see as good and what they see as bad. Religion will also have its own take on abortion. As I've told you, I think that word has been, uh, has been metaphorized into so many things from all those perspectives. And uh, many of our girls, teens, teenagers, are actually being led to abort. She's pregnant. She says, I'm a Catholic. I'm a, this one, I, will not I cannot carry the pregnancy. So let me go and abort. So they'll seek an unsafe abortion. So they're in school. Society has said girls who are pregnant will spoil the other people. They expel them. So to avoid expulsion, they will go and seek an unsafe abortion somewhere. The other one, uh, I think, as a specialist, really, is uh, the lack of clarity al al around the laws regarding abortion in Uganda. Well, I have learned a lot about legal things and laws rec in the recent past. I think uh, what I need to speak out is that a significant number of induced abortions, when I speak induced, there is the ones we do for medical reasons. We're using the same methods, by the way. You're using the same drugs, the same methods. Even the ones for non-medical reasons, you're using the same drugs, the same methods. But a big chunk of the induced abortions actually occur in the hospitals. Many of them are for medical reasons. And a significant number of women, and even health practitioners, if you read the news, almost daily you're hearing arrest, harassment, stigmatization by law enforcement and communities and religious leaders for the actions we do either way, either to provide safe abortion or unsafe. They will stigmatize us equally. Then there is that uh, thing in the Constitution, which is big, Article 22, which says no one has a right to terminate the life of an unborn child except as authorized in the law. Now, for all the years I have practiced, which are almost 20, nobody has clarified to me. I hear from my senior consultant sometime, I think this is okay. I think this is okay, but there's been no cl document to clarify the intentions of what we call a therapeutic abortion. It's a form of induced abortion as well. So we need the law to come out clearly, either through policy document or something that is actually tagging that can give us a clue on what they mean as authorized by the law. Because even when we do the lawful ones, what we think is the lawful ones, sometimes we are swept with the tide. So how do you personalize this? So even women who are seeking for medical reasons may sometimes be denied services because professionals may think otherwise, or they are so tired. And they have heard several stories in the press, nurse arrested here, doctor here, for procuring abortion, so many. Just rampant in the press that uh, medical workers, for whatever reason, whether they're offering abortions, post-abortion care, or others are being arrested or harassed. And uh, as somebody who has had medical issues before, these things don't last a lifetime. You may even outlast your practice sometimes. So in that context, are there solutions to this problem of unsafe abortion? I think uh, we need to, I think there have been several efforts to try and bring this to the forefront. But as I've told you that whenever you mention the word abortion, the first thing people want to do is to stone without understanding the way you're just defining your abortion. So in the layman's language, abortion means 
in medicine, it is terminating a pregnancy for whatever reason. We've had women who come and they have had what we call a miscarriage. Medicine, we call it a spontaneous abortion. Once you write there, spontaneous abortion, come back and tell you, doctor, remove this word. Otherwise, my husband will send me away from home. Or she will get a beating. So we need to clarify these terms. We need to use them appropriately. But most importantly, we must find solutions to reduce unsafe abortions, but also stop mothers dying from unsafe abortions. So let us think back on the EDHS of 2016. Among married women, even, even, them, they ask, even them they come seeking for abortion services. Among married women, seven in 10, which is 67%, have a demand for family planning. They want to avoid the next pregnancy. 28% of them, the need is not met, and 39% are using a method. So the 67 is the 28% who are not, who, who need but are not getting, plus 39% who are using something. So all of them need that. So that seven in 10 should be catered for, and I know there are efforts to try and build that up. But also you understand the challenges around COVID. Access, transport may have denied women this opportunity. Now, we have the second group, who are the sexually active unmarried people. If you look at the UBOS Fertility Family Planning Atlas, I think uh, more than half of the unmarried women are having sex, more than half. The demand for family planning methods among unmarried sexually active women is about 83%. It's even much higher than those who are married. And the, the unmet need is slightly higher, 32%, but also the use is more in that group. So it means targeting interventions should target that group as well, but 51%. Now, if we are to reduce the mortality or the deaths from, from pregnancy-related complications, then we have to factor in the use of family planning as a method. Now, UBOS does very good data collection and very good analysis, and these documents are online. If you look at the family planning atlas, they took a sample from 2012 to 2018, and they showed the, the usage of family planning methods going up. And they showed that uh, the number of unintended pregnancies within that space of time hmm, rose from 637,000 to over a million that were prevented. So by using family planning, you will prevent unintended pregnancies. If you, if you prevent unintended pregnancies, of course you will prevent unsafe abortions. And that number also is in those charts in the UBOS family planning atlas. But most importantly, the number of deaths that are averted from women dying because of unsafe abortion are done. Okay. So for the people who are religious, abstinence may have a role, but this needs to be studied for, this needs to have, this, this needs to be studied further. Of importance is the legal framework. So the healthcare fraternity, what we are asking for is tell us what is illegal, what is illegal. So that we can offer services safely. Uh, the laws are restrictive on some situations but also we need to change the attitude to prevent harassment and other things. The penal code must change, I think. It's a very old law. The penal code only says you can do surgery to do the abortion, but um, as you are aware now, we can also use medicines. So if you use medicines, you may get arrested. Awogu and other associations of professionals, I think we need to really step up our advocacy, which we are trying to do, and we must support the Ministry of Health with scaling up trainings for all healthcare workers to give evidence-based care for abortion. Training institutions, there is a problem now, girls are not at school. Can the schools, can there be a solution to keep these girls engaged from getting pregnant? That mechanism can be done. Sexuality education is something we have dodged and dodged and dodged, but there's no more dodging. I think it needs to come up. Then there must be, the curriculum must be changed or, or broadened to include training on a safe abortion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Musana. I have learned a lot. I hope you have also learned a lot. 
Uh, usually when people talk about abortion, it evokes a lot of emotion, and, as he said. And uh, people don't sit down to contextualize and put it in perspective that we have over 800 abortions happening every single day in this country. How do we address this issue? Do we address it by abusing the healthcare workers who are trying to provide help and support? Or are we going to address it by putting in place laws and policies that are responsive to women's health care needs? That is a question we are here to try and grapple with and answer. But for now, we have a short video that we are going to play that just puts things in perspective, especially for our health care workers who are at the front line being arrested all the time. Thank you. Since the first lockdown in March last year, news has been awash with reports of raging unplanned and teenage pregnancies. The 2020 Minister of Health report on maternal mortality showed that 35% of unwanted pregnancies nationwide end up in abortions, with abortion highlighted to cause 8% of maternal mortality deaths. This raises the importance of post-abortion care at health facilities. Worldwide, the standard is that about one in 10 pregnancies will end up in an abortion. And that doesn't matter whether the country criminalizes or the country does not criminalize. The difference lies in uh, whether the abortion a woman is going to have will be safe or unsafe. And unsafe and secretive abortions have left many girls suffering grave complications that need urgent medical attention. Uh, either the short-term ones where they come with infections become bleeding uh, uh, but a number of them are coming as long term when they come with issues of fertility they have infertility and many will suffer morbidities or, or, or mortality if it is very unfortunate concern has however reason over law enforcement officers who arrest medical personnel giving post-abortion care in 2012 Rubaga hospital fell victim According to medics at the hospital, a lady was brought in with grave complications after an unsafe abortion. Unfortunately, the lady later passed on. The hospital was drugged to court, and even though the case was dismissed, medics say such incidents create fear around offering post-abortion care. And to us, they came with complications, but they came as late attendancy. And the patient was already in the late stages of shock. The general call is that if one must be taken on by law enforcers, only ingredients required in evidence collection must be paid attention to. But the policemen, many of them don't even know about the law related abortion. So they don't know that post-abortion care, that is assisting a patient who has an abortion complication, whether the patient has terminated the pregnancy herself or has been assisted by law, in Uganda or anywhere, it's not a crime. And this is majorly because there, it's very difficult to tell whether a person is giving post-abortion care or if they are inducing an abortion, because usually the interventions are the same. You need to first of all know what the police is investigating, what they have on the table, who alleged who the complainant, what if it's this woman who, who complained, or the parents or the husband. Sometimes some of our complainants some of our complainants want to report as whistleblowers. And we are duty bound to protect their identity. Law enforcers have also been urged on professionalism during their work. Because we'd expect a, a, professional, a professional police person to know the right way of acquiring information. Not publicizing before, evidence, before true evidence is identified. The thin line between procuring a miscarriage and offering post-abortion care leaves great responsibility on the side of medical personnel to avoid being caught up in law. A consent form is very key in providing these abortions. Because in most cases, if you have a consent form, you have proof that you didn't start the abortion, but you are saving a life. We would want health workers to be ethical, to know the boundaries between what is permitted by law and what is not permitted. People go and open what they call clinics or drug shops and start operating and then doing doing all kinds of uh, surgical procedures where they don't have the tools, neither the equipment or even the knowledge 
People have been doing that. So as long as these things are done properly in accordance with what the medical council wishes, then we have no issues with this uh, with, with, the, with the medical people. Namajiren. Thank you. I hope you have learned a lot from that video. It just tries to throw light on the plight that many health workers are facing and the fear that they get every time they try to provide even post-abortion care, which is legal in our context. So to give more light to this discussion, I'm going to invite a panel of experts. They are going to, they are going to come forward. Uh, take a seat and uh, they are going to explain a few things. So the first person I have on my panel is uh, Miss Susan Baluka, who works with uh, FIDA, but is also a lawyer. She will like, introduce herself greatly. Susan, you can step forward and take a seat. I also have Dr. Isaac Odong, who works with uh, IPAS Alliance, IPAS Africa Alliance. He's also here with us today to throw more light on the context and situation. Dr. Isaac, you're very welcome. Uh, the third person I have is Miss Juliet Nankanja from Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum, which is here. She will also introduce herself. And finally, we have uh, a special guest, which is uh, Dr. Richard Mugahi who is the Assistant Commissioner for Reproductive Health from the Ministry of Education. Dr. Mgahi, you're very welcome. Dr. Ministry of Health, sorry, not education. And I started with doctor, imagine that. You're very welcome. We are happy to have you here. This panel of experts is going to answer a few targeted questions to do with uh, the context in the country today and what we have. So, uh, our dear panelists, I'm going to give each one of you one minute to just introduce yourself, tell us where you're coming from. Tamla uh, Ganda, explain yourself. Who are you? What are you? Yes, thank you. I'll start with you, Susan. Thank you, Rose. Um, once again, my name is Susan Baluka. Uh, and I'm a lawyer, an advocate of the High Court of Uganda, but most importantly for the purposes of this particular forum, I'm a member of the Legal Support Network, which is a network of lawyers that works towards creating an enabling environment for health workers to provide um, safe abortion and post-abortion care services. Dr. Mgahi, thank you, Susan. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Mugai. Uh, I work with the Ministry of Health as the Assistant Commissioner for Reproductive Health and Infant Health. Um, what else? I've been a service provider and now I'm actually at policy level and uh, I welcome all of you. Thank you. Juliet, you can take the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nankanja Juliet, and I work with Human Rights Awareness and Promotion Forum. I'm the legal clerk there, but also I've been doing a lot of advocacy with uh, adolescent young girls and university students around the issue of abortion and also sexual reproductive health rights. Dr. Isaac. Thank you. Um, I'm called Dr. Isaac Odongo. I work with IPAS Africa Alliance, and IPAS Africa Alliance is an organization globally known for fighting for women's rights so that we do not have debilitating conditions resulting from unsafe abortion and making sure these women fight for their rights. So we operate here in Kampala, Busia, Tororo, and other districts, and then also in the East African region. So I'm based here in Kampala, I'm the country rep. Thank you. Thank you so much, our dear panelists. I hope everyone is now familiar with them, who they are, what they do, and why they are seated at the frontier, and you're not. So I'll start with Susan. Susan, Dr. Msana was saying, we don't know what is allowed, we don't know what is not allowed. You've told us you are a lawyer. Can you kindly explain to us what is the 
legal status of abortion in the country right now. Thank you, Rose. Um, thank you, Rose. Um, so currently, I think as Dr. Musana rightly pointed out, um, the legal status of abortion in the country is, um, to say the least, quite confusing. Um, of course, we have um, Article 22, two of the um, Constitution which stipulates that no one shall terminate the life of an unborn child, um, save as may be provided for by law. And um, when we look at the, for, for the lawyers who are listening into the discussion, when you look at um, rules of constitutional interpretation, you can even go to the Hansard, refer to the Hansard as a way of interpreting the law. That Hansard actually shows or indicates that Parliament was supposed to pass an act um, that would provide for those circumstances in which the life of an unborn child, quote unquote, could be terminated. However, the current law that we have that um, would comes close to, to defining um, what would be the circumstances where um, inducing an abortion may be permissible is section 223 of the Penal Code Act. And um, as Dr. Musana rightly pointed out, this is an act that only uh, provides for exemptions to procuring an abortion where surgical means are used and only if it is for purposes of saving the life of the mother. And of course it adds saying that this will um, depend on the reasonable skills that are being used by the, pers by the person. In this case, the presumption is that that is the medical personnel and taking into account the general status of the, of the mother and the general circumstances of the case. Now that is very, very ambiguous because um, a, a medical practitioner will wonder, okay, so what are the, the circumstances that you should or shouldn't um, permit me to procure an abortion or to induce an abortion? Um, and that's what causes um, the confusion. But of course, what even um, creates more confusion is the policy framework because we have a policy framework that um, is supposed to guide the health practitioners in their work. And it, um, when you look at the um, national guidelines and service standards for sexual reproductive health and rights, they do provide for circumstances where um, an abortion may be induced on medical grounds, but also on what Dr. Mosana referred to as non-medical grounds, especially um, grounds relating to sexual gender-based violence, that is rape, incest, and defilement. And so when you look at the, the discord between those two, um, the, the, the legal provision and then the policy provisions on the circumstances where um, an abortion can be legally induced, it becomes quite difficult for a medical practitioner to really appreciate um, what, what is permissible and what isn't. Out of, of course, that goes without saying that when you look at established case law for the lawyers that are listening in, we know that sometimes um, legal provisions that may not be clear are expounded on by decisions from courts. And some decisions from common law courts, which Uganda is, can also be guided by, or which Ugandan courts can also be guided by, um, have actually expounded on the definition of the, of the word life. So you find that there are cases where courts have held that when you talk about saving the life, it goes beyond saving the physical life. It's all about the, the, not only the physical well-being, but also the mental and emotional well-being of a person. So if a woman may not necessarily have medical grounds, um, uh, strictly speaking, for which she may want to um, procure an abortion or to have an, an abortion induced to terminate her pregnancy, she may not be in um, a proper state of mind, especially for instance where maybe she has been raped or the pregnancy has arisen from, from um, an incestuous sexual relationship which she may not have known was incestuous at the time or if it has been, um, it, has, it has arisen from an incident of defilement. We've all seen stories, especially during this lockdown, where fathers have defiled their own daughters and 
you know, pregnancies have arisen from that. So there may not be medical grounds, strictly speaking, for such scenarios, but it is really um, distressful for the, for the woman or girl in such a situation. And in other jurisdictions, common law jurisdictions, it has been expounded on that that can also amount to a circumstance where an abortion can be procured. However, to come back to Uganda, we have not even gotten the opportunity um, to have our jurisprudence built to that extent. And this is mostly because um, the cases, the abortion cases that arise, that, that are reported to police and where arrests are conducted, even of the health workers, do not actually go through the entire um, legal process. Um, as, as was pointed out, these are cases that usually cause a lot of sensation within the communities where they occur. And you find that the medical practitioner or the health practitioner's um, career is on the line. You know, th um, there's a lot of sensational reporting on the issue or, the, or on the incident. So the medical practitioner is usually um, extorted at the end of the day usually by the family of, of, of the woman or girl, especially if it's um, uh, an adolescent young girl or, or woman, um, she, they, they are extorted by that family as um, in exchange for having the charges dropped. So usually these cases actually don't go through the, uh, the, the legal channels. They don't go get the opportunity of getting to the courts where judges or judicial officers would have even the opportunity to expound on our jurisprudence and to uh, better articulate the meanings of some of those um, exceptions within the existing law, even despite its being obsolete. Thank you so much for that clarity. If at all it amounted to clarity, I feel I'm a bit more confused than when we had started, but thank you for making an attempt, Suzanne. I'll go to you, Dr. Isaac. You have worked within this legal framework for a great many number of years. Can you tell us what your experience has been and what impact has this had on service delivery? Uh, just to start up the conversation, I want to thank Dr. Musana very much. Uh, he has really shown us that uh, professionalism can be differentiated from personal beliefs. You know, we, many of us and those out there listening usually bring in their personal beliefs into professionalism, and that one spoils the mix, especially in this department that we're talking about. So to really stimulate our thinking, I would like to first ask ourselves, uh, like how many have had a friend or a relative talking negatively about somebody who has had an abortion? No matter of which aspect of abortion we are talking about, whether induced. So that one is food for thought. I'm sure many of us have done that. And then how many believe that women who have had complications with their pregnancy have the right to safe, high quality sexual reproductive health services? How many? food for thought as we go along. And then how many believe that a woman who got raped should carry the pregnancy? How many believe? Out here, out there, how many believe? This is where we have to differentiate between our beliefs and professionalism and the person whom we're talking about, who is the woman? And then of course we want to know how many believe that a girl who was raped by the father as our land friend put it? Why? Why should a girl who was raped by the father keep the pregnancy? Are you thinking about the girl? Are you thinking about your religion? Or are you thinking about the community or the society? So now I want to now quickly go into what this framework has done for us. First of all, the framework is so restrictive, ambiguous, uncoordinated, difficult to understand, and even the lawyers themselves do not understand. Uh, it is actually a real mix of things that uh, makes it so difficult, both for those operating at facility level, even those at the policy level, including our law enforcers. They don't understand the framework itself. So what has this framework done to the society? First of all, it has pushed the abortion ecosystem underground. So what underground means, it gives a fertile ground 
for people to provide unsafe, very dangerous and uncalled for procedures for these women who want to make an intention to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. So most of the pregnancies that go down there are unwanted. So that is what I wanted to say about um, the framework, what it has done. Largely, it has caused more of unmet need. The needs is there, but the framework has restricted us. So the women's rights have now become a fighting ground. That's what the framework has done. The women and their rights have become a fighting ground between the state, between the religious churches and the mosques, between the cultural norms, and also between the woman herself, to the extent that this framework does not make even a woman believe on what she's supposed to do with herself. She doesn't have the right to her thinking. She doesn't have the right to her body. So this framework has caused that. And now what has this resulted into, practically, at our level? One, there's a lot of unsafe abortions. We lose about 8 to 18% of women in the world due to abortions. Dr. Musan has put our uh, statistics very correctly. And uh, you remember we used to talk about losing 16 women every day due to unsafe abortion. That means one taxi of 16 people die every day because of our framework and how what it is causing. And we're very happy about it. We report it in the statistics and we're happy to say uh, we lost so many mothers in the mortality rate. So this has also increased the mortality rates of women, especially the maternal mortality rate, which has really um, went up and we they say unsafe or anything to do with abortion gives a proportion to the maternal deaths. And many of us in the developing world, especially our women, because they are so poor, they succumb to these unsafe methods which has been pushed down underground in the ecosystem, which we ourselves are uh, architects of. Right? And uh, so there has been delays. That is one of the impact in my experience because of that. People are fearing, so no one comes for treatment. They hide. They go and get isolated, and now as a result, they do not get proper treatment. They end up buying medicines from pharmacies and drug shops, and this one complicates it further because those who would have helped them are also stigmatized at that level because of this framework. They don't know what type of abortion you are carrying. So when you come, even if you are having the one which is legally acceptable, the health worker will not accept to treat you because they think they'll be apprehended. So the, in the extent to, the, to that extent, you find that people are getting very poor treatment because they think you are the cause of your abortion, therefore they give you very poor treatment or you are neglected. And that leads to a lot of complications and life-threatening and lifelong complications that our girls face. Um, Girls, in my view, are forced to become mothers against their wills. That is what the framework, because of its uh, stigmatizing aspect, people are forced to become mothers against their will because they cannot make a decision. And once they make a decision, the people who are supposed to provide services cannot make a decision, simply because they don't have policies, guidelines, and everything in place to make their work safe. So their workplaces is not a safe area and it's a no-go zone for them. Thank you. Thank you for that context, uh, Dr. Isaac, and telling us how it has been pushed underground. Uh, Dr. Amsana's statistics were telling us how many of the abortions that actually happen end up being unsafe because people can't acquire the necessary safe help, but also the fact that many of our health workers end up not being trained to actually provide uh, post-abortion care or to treat abortion-related complications because of some of these laws and policies. So I will move to Dr. Mgahi. Dr. Mgahi, uh, Dr. Msana delivered a very powerful keynote speech, and he talked about the ambiguity in the laws and policies we know that there are 2006 guidelines that provide some sort of hope or some sort of clarity in terms of what needs to be done or the interventions that need to be made at a point of a person seeking comprehensive abortion care. But also he talked about the unmet need for family planning within the country. 
which has been made worse because of COVID-19 and the fact that there is frequent stock out of SRHR commodities. Uh, and also he mentioned, I was surprised he mentioned many statistics that were produced by Ministry of Health. I didn't know that they were actually carrying some of those indicators, but it is good to see that that is happening. So my question to you is, what is the government doing to address barriers to sexual reproductive health rights, specifically looking at unsafe abortion, and also in terms of addressing what needs to happen for post-abortion care? Um, thank you so much, uh, moderator. Um, I also want to appreciate my friend and colleague, Dr. Musana, for that very elaborate uh, presentation. And, uh, and where we stand with the all the, the, the lacuna and the gray areas regarding this very important topic. Um, the Minister of Health, uh, he rightly put it, uh, um, there is no clear law, uh, but we are at operational level, we have um, guiding documents like the SRH, uh, implementation framework, we have um, the SRH policy almost complete, but there are quite a number of documents because uh, we are cognizant about the dangers that abortion causes. We do generate the information. We, we are very good at counting. Um, we, we clearly know where abortions are taking place, what contribution in terms of maternal mortality they, 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 they make what contribution they make in terms of mobility. So clearly, uh, and there is this information is available and we want to use uh, this information as evidence for proper planning. Um, we do plan for SRH services and, uh, and um, our major concern is to make sure there is uh, access uh, to SRH services uh, regarding all the dimensions of access that we can talk about. They, they should be affordable, um, they should be uh, appropriate. He talked about quality, uh, he talked about issues of training, uh, they should be acceptable. Uh, all the other dimensions that you, you had, there's a lot of unacceptability and um, for us, that's our mandate now to make sure that these services are available, services are affordable, services are acceptable, and uh, um, uh, the, the, the people who are offering them are well-trained and approachable. So um, the Ministry of Health, knowing very clearly that there is a, a lacuna in the law uh, in terms of abortion, and the abortion is going on, so we, we also, part of our SRH programs is we have a post-abortion package. Uh, and uh, post-abortion package uh, is part of the high impact interventions because we do understand, we know that abortion is one of the leading causes of maternal death. Uh, to be very exact, in the last uh, year, last uh, the year that's ending, we, we are finalizing the compilation of of this year's uh, uh, maternal and perinatal death audit. But last year, abortion was number three, sepsis due to abortion, number three among the leading causes of death, and number one amongst women between 15 and 24 years, number one. So uh, it's a big issue, and I'm really happy that this discussion is happening. So um, usually, he has clearly talked about the casket. And, uh, and science doesn't lie most of the time. Sometimes I work in the COVID arena. When we post the numbers, people say you are now announcing prematurely the third wave. But these numbers don't lie, and we know where they're coming from. These numbers uh, are coming from the community. These numbers are uh, not just formed on the street. They're coming from the community. So where these numbers are coming from, there is a problem. Either there is a broken health system, there is a broken social system, there's a, there's a break somewhere. And, and we need to, to critically examine where this break is. We need to critically examine where this break is. 
Um, I did mention that for us as the healthcare, we want to push as much services closer to the community as possible. So um, when we have this kind of information, we examine ourselves. I've talked about the post-abortion package. Uh, um, Dr. Musa and I didn't want to talk about abortion, but we also have another term. We call it postpartum, postpartum package. Uh, partum in our language is the first uh, six weeks. Uh, postpartum, we consider that to be the first six weeks. They are very critical because a lot can happen and, and uh, life can be lost in those first three weeks, uh, six weeks. So um, we monitor that period very closely after abortion and we have a package. Uh, in that package, one of the things that we emphasize on is counseling on family planning. We are privileged, we, we are not doing Badly, we are doing well in terms of family planning uh, uh, methods and mix, and we keep uh, uh, responding with with strength to see what new other methods can come on board. So, family planning methods are available. We've involved community uh, mobilizers, the VHTs. In some of your local communities, there are even people who uh, move family planning to the doorsteps. So. Uh, Offering post-abortion or postpartum family planning is one of the key interventions that the Ministry of Health is emphasizing on. We are cognizant that abortion comes from an unwanted pregnancy. An unwanted pregnancy comes from uh, um, unprotected sex. And, uh, and um, unprotected sex comes probably because of lack of information about family planning and all those uh, um, conditions. So um, when we offer this, we also have other added services, depending on the circumstances, because sometimes this could be a rape, could be a defilement. There are other services of HIV screening, uh, um, uh, PrEP, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, and, and, and that whole continuum of making sure that the victim actually is, um, is well catered for. And uh, the issue of whether it's the, the, the um, and this should be my last point, whether the woman has a right uh, because of her health status to, to, to procure an abortion, our legal friends here have to help us. But for us, despite that, uh, or, um, we know we have emergency contraception, which is one of, uh, in the recent study actually, it shows emergency contraception is going up, up, up. It's, it's one of the methods of family planning that's really having a sharp uh, um, rise. It's an area that we are getting very interested in as scientists, because meaning that uh, there is accidental sex, uh, people are rushing in to, to, to make sure that they have uh, emergency contraception. Sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it works, as Musa now will tell you. So these are the issues we, we have to contend with, and, and I'm really happy that this discourse is happening. We have those packages. We still have a very serious duty to take them very uh, to the commonest people. We have a duty to train our health workers, also change the community attitude towards abortions so that they can support these people and... and uh, not to abort, but post-abortion care, because the abortion has happened. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mgahi. You said many things. It's the accidental sex which, <laughs> which somehow stood out for me. But uh, <laughs> yes, Juliet, I will come to you. You have heard what he said, that uh, we need to critically look at reasons why people end up in situations where they need post-abortion care, but also need to have an abortion. Can you explain to us some of those key reasons in your work that you have done? Why do you think people go to these extremes? How does this happen? How have we found ourselves in this situation? Okay. Thank you very much, Rose. And I would like to thank Dr. Musana and then also my fellow panelists for the information they've availed so far. And um, some of the reasons that 
uh, we've discovered why people go to these extremes is one that everyone keeps pointing out. There's a, a huge, huge lack of information out there. People don't know things. People assume, assume things or people only do things by hearsay. Okay, they hear something from somebody and they do it. Like for example, uh, like I said, I've done these, um, I've done advocacy around sensitizing adolescent young girls and women and also university students. And what I've discovered is sometimes we do what we call plenary or we ask them questions and we try to find out how they find themselves in such troubles. And some of them tell you that maybe I'm afraid that my parents will punish me or they give, they, they give several reasons why they are trying to have an abortion. But then they tell you the way they do it and that is the most absurd part about it. Because I remember the one that is most recent, I was in um, a session up north, and one of the methods actually these girls talked about was boiling a 500 shilling coin in hot water, and then you take it, and apparently it's supposed to what? To induce an abortion. So as you can tell, like if you think about it, like where is the science in that? How did they come up with it? But for some reason, this is the information they have, right? And probably this information they got from somebody. And so how they get themselves in such problems or how if we women find ourselves in such problems is because we don't have the information, okay? Um, civil society really tries to put this information out there, but sometimes we don't reach everybody, okay? So one of the reasons is there's a huge, huge lack of information, and that is one of the gaps that leads to this. Another thing is that thing that I was talking about, the whole idea of fear of what is going to happen to me, or of I have to do this. The doctor actually explained that, and he said that sometimes there's a group of women that will go to even the doctor. And no matter what you say, no matter how you counsel them, no matter what you do with them, they are determined to not keep this baby for reasons known to them. And sometimes the reasons can be just as simple as, I do not want to be pregnant, not right now. Okay, and it doesn't even, they're not even thinking about, oh, maybe you have the financial means to do it, or oh, you're of a certain age, or oh, those things. It's just that I don't want to be pregnant. That is one of the simplest reasons. But for many of us, uh, many of, of the women, what I've understood is that the whole idea around um, the, the fact that if you get pregnant, maybe out of wedlock, uh, that is going to affect your chances in so many things. Okay, so that is one of the reasons that pushes most young girls and women to actually have abortions because they are like, then I'll be stained for life. And that's the whole, it takes us back to the issue of stigma as well. Okay, you don't only have the stigma then when you've had an abortion, but you also have stigma because you are an, an, a single mom. You know, it's something that's frowned upon in our society. So somebody is forced to choose. Mm -hmm. So, um, another reason that we found out why um, uh, girls or women end up having abortions is because, um, like, for example, the national policy is providing for instances of gender-based violence, okay? So people are found, have found themselves in uh, relationships, but the relationships are not actually good. And then the mother is thinking, okay, how can I bring a child in this kind of a home? Okay, how can I raise her if they're beating me? There's even a video of recent that was circulating and a pregnant mother was being beaten by the husband. They, I think it was like a four-year-old son is standing there watching naked. The mother is completely naked and is being whooped. And, and she's heavily pregnant, but nobody or this mother has to also bring that baby up and also understand this is like the mother's mental state as well is being affected at the same time, okay? Because now she's thinking, I have to bring this baby up in this kind of violence. What are her chances as well? Or what are his chances, whatever the sex of the baby, okay? Then um, another reason that we found is that most people are 
like the doctor was saying that education is one of those aspects that helps uh, maybe, or at least statistics are showing that there's less pregnancies in people who are going to school, but uh, more in those who have not had an opportunity, okay? So you find that those who haven't had an opportunity to actually go to school will also not have an opportunity to even understand their own bodies, okay? Because um, the way our African cultures are, you find that it's taboo to talk about most things. Most things are going to be told to you in a certain way that you may never really, really understand them. So, and most times uh, when you, you, you come of a certain age, the, you're going to have hormones that are raging within you and you're going to conduct your, yourself in a certain way. So you might end up what the doctor here called ac having accidental sex. Okay, and then when you have accidental sex, there's going to be accidental consequences or accidental pregnancies. And so what happens there is that you're forced to either then become a mom if you want to or don't want to, or you're going to say, you know what, no matter what, I'm not becoming a mom, okay? So those are some of the incidences. Uh, thank you so much, Juliet. I think that has expounded and given reasons. Information services, information services. If people don't have information, they'll end up having unsafe abortions. I'm going to open it up to the general public. Do you have any questions for our panelists? Do you have any comments you want to put to them? If you have something, kindly raise your hand. I'll request my colleague Edith to take the microphone to you. And you can just say the person you want to answer the question, and they'll be able to respond. Thank you. You can see Dr. Kayondo. We can start from there. Thank you very much. Um, I thank the keynote speaker and the panelists and the moderator. Uh, I'm Simon Peter Kayondo, uh, an obstetrician from the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Uganda. Um, mine are short questions, but all are to Dr. Richard. The Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists had made, has made an effort to reach as many health workers as possible in all regions of the country. Partly it's training, but partly it's fact finding. And one of the things that cuts across is health workers generally lack skills and supplies for even post-abortion care. It's a concern you find everywhere. And yes, we try to work through partners to try and address these issues, but we know that the Minister of Health holds that mandate primarily. What are you doing to address that particular gap? Skilling in service, but also providing adequate drugs and supplies for post-abortion care. The last one is not really a question, it's a note. And you spoke about the increased uptake of emergency contraception. And I, I think that is an opportunity, but it's also a challenge, taking it from my clients. People actually choosing emergency contraception against long and short acting methods of contraception. And there is a problem. And when they say, I'm using emergency contraception, and you take your time to dig deeper to find out what they're actually using, you'll be surprised on how they are misusing the methods of contraception that are available. They are not actually using the real scientific emergency contraception. But there's also a challenge. Why are they not taking up the other methods and sometimes inappropriately using what would be termed emergency contraception. So it could be that we are not offering enough information about the other methods, but also not offering enough information about the emergency contraception itself. And that is partly 
uh, what explains the high failure rates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kayondo. Sunshine, uh, there is another one there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, particularly, Dr. Amsan, I opened a lot of, I think, an awareness about the statistics I didn't think were available around um, termination of pregnancies in this country. And it's very painful that as a country we have statistics and we choose to deny. And the Bible that uh, the, the, our, our, our religious leaders try to, to point to says truth makes you free. And I think they need to get on the drawing board and be free from denying that certain things are happening in this country. Uh, just to counsel Susan, she talked about um, the legal provisions for terminating a pregnancy as being medical, and you said you think they are also social and mental. I think medical is, is, is encompasses the, more, the mental and the social because you are not completely well unless you have a complete mental and social well-being at any state of time. So if I, I would like to terminate a pregnancy, it means my mental and psychological part of being medically fit is, is not clear. I'm not well. Because if I'm, I'm, I'm not sleeping because I'm pregnant, it means I'm not medically fit. So I can choose to terminate that pregnancy because I need to have a peace of mind in order to be healthy. Uh, the other bit I would like to say is about the politics of the body. And I think women, the women's uterus, there is this famous saying that the rosary should get out of my uterus. I think we are tired of hearing that uh, people are terminating pregnancies, they are ungodly. But I think God loves a person who is happy. God doesn't want to see children languishing in the community without support, being battered. You have been seeing on TV, children have been produced uh, and they were not loved, who are locked in uh, pig styes, in dog pens, because parents brought these children on earth without their consent. And the consent is being given by the law that you can do it, but you need to get medical reasons to terminate. And so who determines the medical reasons is the WHO guideline, which says medical is about complete well-being, including mental and social health. But we are running away from it and also saying, this is wrong, this is illegal. And that's why the policemen are also doing the work in a bizarre manner, because they, they, they are taking it um, from lip service, but also from the, so, the, the socialization that a, a pregnancy cannot be terminated for any reasons. I would like to share my story. I live with HIV and uh, around 1997, uh, I got pregnant. I had had children before, but I chose to terminate it. I was not feeling well, and I didn't think I would go full term. And uh, I did terminate that pregnancy. Neither my husband nor the ideals of the religion I go to could stop me because I knew what I want. The uterus belongs to me, and I determine how I use it to suit my purpose and to suit my health. So I didn't, the only difference is that a number of our children are getting pregnant and women are getting pregnant and they don't know what to do. I went to a medical doctor and I said, I need to have this out. My husband was like, now if you die, don't go near kwasa. If I die, I die for me. And if I live with it, maybe I won't even go to full term. And you want those praises that she died during labor. Really, do we need a statistic that she died in battle? Do I need to fight to, to bring a child on earth, yet I can make a decision to not have that child then or that pregnancy full term because I, am, I feel I'm not ready, I'm not well. And when COVID comes, I think I've, I, I've talked to a number of women with children of 15, 13 to 15 telling me their children are pregnant and I'm both pro-choice and pro-people. So I tell them the good things about keeping the pregnancy and the good things about terminating the pregnancy. And I refer them to where they can be supported to produce or not to produce. And I think for me, I have nothing 
uh, charging my mind that I have asked someone to go and terminate a pregnancy. 13 year old, I look at them and I look at my daughter. My daughter just finished university. And I'm just wondering, this girl could have also gone and completed university. Or maybe my son could have gone on and you know, got a child of their choice or at the time they are ready to have a child. And so I'm saying, do we need to force people to keep pregnancies that they will live to regret and only yesterday, I talked to a lady who is 50 years old. She still regrets having terminated a pregnancy. When she was HIV positive, had lost her husband, she was weak, she had three children to take care of. And she still blames herself. I told her, you don't need to blame yourself over anything. Maybe you could have also died and these three wouldn't have had anyone to take care of them. Now they are grown, you are well. You can choose now to have a baby at your timing and of your choice. So the way the world has chosen to use women's bodies to determine where resources go is a big deal. Look at our national budget. Very little money goes into maternal health. And I would like to um, implore our member of parliament here, please, you sit on the health committee, you sit on the HIV committee, please, let's have more money going into uh, medicine, into health. Even the Abuja declaration where we said we would allocate 15% of the gross domestic product, product, we have not. And we continue to, to say we are securing the future. Which future? With 5,000 children being born, girls being impregnated over COVID time in only one district, what future are you creating? And somebody saying that it's okay they are pregnant, they didn't die of COVID. Really, is this where we want to go? I think people should remove their decisions and discussions from our uterus. We know how to deal with it. We can make decisions about it. Let them allocate resources to health. Let people do safe abortions. And finally, I will say this. We are all talking about young women. And I want to talk as a 52-year-old. And I do know 45s to 50 are doing abortion right now. Who is even knowing what is going on? Where they are getting their abortions? We would love to see statistics talking about the 50s to 60s, that menopause period when women are desperate to have babies, or maybe they are in relationships with young boys and they would like to terminate. And I think they are doing serial pregnancies and terminations. So who is actually thinking about all the women? Everyone is talking about the young ones. I know I have young ones and we need to care for them. But we are there who produce these young ones. We also need information. And when you don't have it, that's why our children are getting into unsafe abortions. Where is the information? Where is the policy guidance that directs the older person, the older women, us, who have produced these children? who are getting pregnant, to support them to not get pregnant anymore or to get safe abortions. I submit, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sunshine, uh, can you keep it short, sweet, to the point? No lengthy conversations? I will yes. try. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sunshine Fiona Komsana. I'm a feminist lawyer and I work with Akina Mamua Africa. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Mugahi around the, um, the service standard guidelines on SRHR that were recently, that not recently, that were recalled, and um, if there is any work that the Ministry of Health is doing around ensuring that they, the, they are brought back on the agenda, and if there is any support that the civil society can render to the ministry to make sure this happens, because they expanded um, the the circumstances under which someone can uh, access uh, safe abortion, including sexual violence, incest, and things like that. And so I also wanted to just make another comment on the fact that um, legal 
illegal or unsafe abortions are actually a condemnation for poor women um, and young girls. It's an issue of class. That there is a reason why the face of the teenage uh, pregnancy crisis is the young girls in Uganda's rural districts and not the ones in international schools posing in front of their parents' luxurious cars. It's an issue of class. And so when we do uh, legislation and also really narrow the, the space within health workers can provide this abortion care, it is that we are condemning poor women, poor girls to death. Legislating women's choice and bodily autonomy is waging political war on women's bodies, and as the statistics that Dr. Musana presented show, those bodies bleed and they bleed to death. Those are not just numbers, those are people's lives. And so the conversation I think also needs to shift uh, to what can, and also this is all again to Dr. Mugahi, to what at the policy level can then be done across sectors, because it's not just a single issue. We have, yes, the issue of violence by men against women and girls, which the justice law and order sector can definitely not handle, looking at the statistics of crime and who gets prosecuted. But then we also have the issue of, the, of education and the pushbacks around comprehensive sexuality education. So the information gaps that really also affect uh, vulnerable girls, again, comes back to to the failure between sectors, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, uh, the Justice Law and Order sector to handle uh, sexual violence, and then also the Ministry of Gender at the social protection level, because when we keep pushing, have these babies, we'll take care of them, but we know that this country doesn't have social protection nets for children. So I think that uh, at the policy level, you need to talk to each other, you need to talk to your friends. I'm sure there is a group <laughs> somewhere where these conversations need to happen and then be able to show how it's important that these um, policy guidelines and that this and that uh, monies and all the things that need to be in place for g women and girls to be able to access safe abortions happen and just to say that I appreciate uh, you being able to have this conversation especially the Ministry of Health but I think it's not just the Ministry of Health that we need to be uh, dealing with. So, thank you very much. Thank you so sure. much. Uh, I see Ronnie, Tony, and the person between me. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Musana uh, gave, set a pace for us for this discussion. So, now, may I call them societal enablers? the religious ones, the cultural ones. As we are here in the room discussing already, Pastor Sempa started bubbling with his, you know. But anyway, uh, one of the things that I have got a chance and worked with Julie, Juliet, and we have managed to reach out to over, I think over 5,000 adults and girls and young women across Uganda. And one of the examples that she was, actually there are so many. I'll just give one. Yes, in a quick one. In Chiruhura district, uh, we happen to work with a faith-based organization that mobilized these adolescent girls and young women. So the discussion was really, <laughs> so we had to tone down on how we are packaging the information and she instructed us that please don't talk about the word abortion. So we are bringing the word abortion in sexual reproductive health and rights. But then later on, these girls came to us giving you a call, you know, I couldn't say this and this because teacher so-and-so was around, but this is what is actually happening, what? In my life. So basically, these girls may not have the time, uh, the right people to talk to, you know, and that's why they get this kind of information of boiling the 500 coin, all that. So I'm happy that the, uh, the school health policy, the discussion has started through cabinet and uh, we have actually advocated for it for over the last 20 years. Through our hashtag, pass the policy now, it's here than the rest of the partners. Yeah, that's really good, because now we, our government has now started to realize that out of this pandemic, most especially this second wave, uh, we have had actually a wave of teenage pregnancies, uh, a wave of uh, abortions, you know, but me here personally, I'm speaking in a position of men. 
I work with the male-led organization, Foundation for Male Engagement. We facilitate these abortions in, most, in our society, so we are societal enablers as well. So because of cultural barriers and the religious barriers, I think it's high time that we engage the men you know, in communities. And I'm happy as it's more, we have a male engagement strategy that we're going to use to engage communities more. Communities need to be engaged more on this discussion. So uh, the issue of uh, poorly trained health workers that Dr. Musana talked about, I think the ambiguity among them is also based on the laws. So I'm requesting anyone that is in the legal department, I'm not a lawyer, I think we need to do something. We need to have more court sessions on this. Because f to be honest, when you have a discussion with a health worker, they will tell you, I would love to give this service to this young girl, but the, the law does not do what? Allow me to do it. And also engaging these other quack doctors who are carrying out, because they are the most ones that are giving out this information to these young people. Yes. So to I engage them, you, I'm winding up. Yes, please. So to engage them, so what I was trying to say is that uh, let's first make the law. Let's work on issues around the law and then also engaging the communities with more information and then to make sure that services are offered to the community. Thank you so much. Thank you for those uh, excellent comments. Uh, kindly, 30 seconds only, we are about to wind up and I want to hand over my microphone to our um, honorable. Sorry. <laughs> proceed. My name is Yvonne. I am a strong member of the coalition of Sismoa. And uh, I would think that we, this is not just going to the speakers. I know we are live on NTV, but when we actually look at the problem, we see that it's even beyond our policymakers. Because much as you might even have the law, you're going to go down to community, even in your consultative process, and they're going to give you a hard time in terms of just particular mere words like abortion. There's a very strong vicious circle around unsafe abortion, teenage pregnancies, unmet need for family planning. When you come in society and see all these problems, you're going to find that they're all interlinked. And even the laws on all these issues are either ambiguous or very slow or very restrictive. So I don't know if we are maybe having a safe conversation still. I don't know if it's because society is still very backward in terms of gender equality. I don't know what the conversation should be at this point because I feel like on several other issues we're always having these conversations. What is the actual problem? Where is the problem? Ministry knows you're losing so much money in terms of unsafe abortion, right? We have the statistics. You have them at ministry. So what is the problem? Is the problem that you can't have an actual law that you can properly implement in society for people to understand that this is an actual problem? Or is the fact that you are providing us ambiguous laws? You have a law on PAC, on post-abortion care. What exactly does it cater to? Is it that you're waiting for someone to first come to you with a body or something rotting in their bodies to show you that I need post-abortion care because I've had an unsafe abortion? So I feel like the conversations we continue to have in these rooms are the same. They're extremely safe. We're not seeing the interlinks in most of these issues. Why is it that the same woman who came to you to get an unsafe abortion or the same person who has come to uh, get a post-abortion post care is the same person you failed to cater for in terms of family planning? Is the same person you're not catering for in terms of gender-based violence? She's the same woman coming to you. Why is it a persistent problem? This is not just to the speakers, by the way. I think it should go to society, you know? Is it so difficult that every single time we're having these conversations, the word goes around the fact that you're uncomfortable with abortion? Some of these policymakers are going to come to you and tell you, ah, me, I don't want to hear that word. But safely in those hospitals, because they have money, they're going to go to a hospital and get a safe abortion for their, girl, for their daughter. You know, but they are so detached from that actual reality that there's someone out there who cannot even afford that one million you're taking to whichever hospital to have a safe abortion quietly for your daughter, and someone else is out there suffering because they don't have that money. So there's a whole vicious circle, there's classism, there's, I don't know, like I don't know what the problem is, but the conversation, why is it still difficult and yet you know that it's happening? Uh, thank you so much. Let's first go back to the panelists and they can answer. Just a point of clarity, Ministry of Health does not have lawmaking powers. They can only pass policy within the ambits of the existing laws. So 
maybe that's one of the restrictions that they may have. So I think we have questions majorly to Dr. Mgahi and to Susan. I request Susan to answer hers in one minute and then I'll leave Dr. Mgahi to grapple with all the comments. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Rose, um, and the um, rest of the participants for the questions that have been raised. Um, in response to the question about um, the definition of medical reasons for procuring an abortion, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are jurisdictions where this has been broadly interpreted to include um, mental and emotional well-being. However, for Uganda, that has not yet been done. We don't have any judgment from a court where they um, expound on um, the, the reason of health as including mental and emotional well-being um, of, of the person for whom the abortion is being procured. But that also speaks to the issue of um, hu the human rights based approach to th the abortion question or litigating on um, the criminalization of abortion laws. So for me as a member of the legal support network who uses a human rights based approach in my lawyering, I will be able to advance that argument for Dr. Mugahi or Dr. Musana should they be arrested for procuring an abortion for a girl who has been defiled by her father. However, another lawyer who does not subscribe to the human rights best approach to lawyering may not agree with that kind of argument. Even the state attorney who will sanction the file and say I think a, a crime has been committed and therefore the case should continue to court may not subscribe to that kind of reasoning. So for them as soon as they receive a file from police that this health worker has been arrested for helping a girl who was defiled by her father procure an abortion Strict looking at the strict definition or the narrow definition, or the narrow provisions in the Penal Code Act which provide for exceptions for, um, for procuring an abortion, for them they will say, you know what, I think on the face of it there is a crime. If they want to argue that they were justified in giving the abortion because of the mental and emotional well-being of, 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 of the girl, then that will be subject to argument in court. As police officers will usually tell you when you are following up a case at, at, at police, they'll tell you, ah, counsel, this is not court. Those ones you argue from what? From court. So it becomes a matter of argument. So for you as a health worker in that particular moment, it will depend on who your lawyer is, but also who the judicial officer is that is presiding over that case. And on that note, I think also to add on to what um, Rose indicated that the Ministry of Health can only um, um, pass policies to kind of address the problem. I think it's also important to know that what, why, why we say that the legal framework is confusing because even those policies within the hierarchy of, of laws, um, a policy cannot override an act. So as a health official, if you're arrested for, uh, say, giving an abortion, on grounds of gender-based violence, you you may not um, easily get off the hook because what what outrightly gives you that mandate is a policy, and it's not an act. So an act has um, higher, is higher in the hierarchy of, of of laws and 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 regulations than a policy. So that is why we say that the entire legal framework is quite confusing. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Mgahi, you have two minutes to answer the many. Uh, thank you so comments. much. And uh, I think uh, listening in from my sister here, she has ably uh, nailed it where the problem is. That confusion, that confusion. And um, I think uh, Dr. Musana didn't tell you that sometimes there's something called defensive medicine. Techiva Kunze. Now, uh, in such circumstances, someone really needs help, but you also know that if lawyers landed on this, I'm in trouble, I have a profession. It's a very, very complicated situation, and del very delicate. Uh, when I was invited here, I again had to look at the intricacies of what I'm going to talk about because of the illegal problems. Um, 
our discussion is so narrowed because of the narrow poly, uh, legal space. Uh, our thinking is so narrowed. So all that package, it becomes a really big issue and probably it also impacts on what we provide at the service delivery point. So back to what Dr. Kayondo asked, uh, and I'm happy he raised it. Because the, 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 it's been a very hazy area, so we, we, are, we are transitioning into really going down and doing all these things. Uh, but putting a procurement that you, 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 you're, you're procuring a post-abortion pack, uh, um, initially it was really a big issue. But I'm happy to report that now we are buying uh, post-abortion packs and sending them to health facilities, as low as Health Center 3, and we are training them. We've even last month we procured some. Uh, because we have evidence that there are issues. There are issues. Our health workers do not have what to use. Uh, we need MVAs. We need uh, um, the other instruments that facilitate to have uh, um, very uh, quality services of post-abortion care. Um, I had earlier mentioned that the supplies, uh, we are improving in supplies and they are uh, greatly available. So the issue of, of uh, lack of skills is an issue that we can continuously work on. Uh, he knows quite very well we are running mentorship programs and some of the focus or target areas are really these big killers, uh, the, the, uh, the areas that are causing high maternal uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, he also did mention that um, we need to interrogate further the issue of, uh, of uh, emergency contraception. I entirely agree with you. Uh, this report first came out last year from the Makerere. We have an annual monitoring system that monitors the, the, the family planning, consumption patterns, the unmet need. So it came out clearly that uh, emergency contraception, uh, contraception was going on the rise. The issue of whether people have information is a huge, huge, huge concern. Uh, they may have the information, but wrong information. With the, 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 the explosion of social media, everyone is an expert on information. Actually, the biggest uh, 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 providers of information apparently are peers. These women don't consult health workers, very rarely, but peer consultation. And, and the rise in EC is about peer consultation. And uh, um, well, might be Aogo and the president is here, they would, should come out very strongly and give that kind of guidance, I'm um, concluding. So information is an issue, but also understanding deeply the sexual patterns. Most of these people have, um, I've been put on the spot for accidental sex, but this is where EC comes in. Imagine say this is unplanned, so I cannot take contraception for the entire mass accident, accidental. So they also, they are using EC also as accidental contraception. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I think that is something that we can uh, uh, Dr. Mgahi, I'm going to cut you short. I we can finished. continue your remarks, but I uh, wanted to invite the honorable. honorable member of parliament to come and make the closing remarks for this particular session before NTV switches us off. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Brother Honorable Ivory Margaret. Thank you so much, moderator. As they've told you, I'm Ayebari Margaret Reviambu, woman member of parliament, representing the people of Umbarara district. I'm a social worker by profession, and uh, someone who is so passionate about uh, sexual reproductive health. I'm a specialist in that area after taking up a postgraduate diploma in sexual reproductive health from Lunds University. I'm a mother of four, I'm a Christian, in fact a daughter of a canon reverend, I'm a subscribed member of Mother's Union, and a politician, meaning I'm a leader. And you know what it means when you're talking about uh, safe abortion when you are a politician? 
But because of a passion that I have for self-motherhood, I have to talk about this. Abortion or termination of pregnancy, whether medical or for social reason, what is important is self-termination. Or else, women will continue to die looking at the 800 procured abortions daily, it becomes really alarming. And I want to say that any woman in a childbearing age is a candidate of an abortion or a pregnancy termination. I want to tell people who are in this room and all those that are watching us outside there that this kind of social issue is at everyone's door. Whether you are a politician, whether you are a religious person, whether you are a cultural leader, your daughter, your wife, your sister is a candidate to this. When it comes to legal and what is not legal, I want to thank you, Dr. Musana. You have clearly put it that even you health workers, you don't know where the lines are, are being drawn. There is no clear act or law that is protecting you even when you're saving lives. You can't know where you're supposed to stop or where you're supposed to begin from. That sometimes you'll find yourselves on the other side of the law even when you're saving the life. And to the policy framework and how it has pushed the termination of a pregnancy or abortion underground, breeding a fertile ground for unsafe abortion, bounces back mostly to my rural women who are poor and not empowered. Is brought to you by. Grab an ice cold bottle of Pepsi Max today and.